I'm wearing this Mantis sleep mask and it is so dark, like it's proper black art. You think black art curtains are good, this is amazing. Does that mean that Mantis Sleep have sponsored this video? Yes, they have. They have? They have. <laughs> right. I cannot see a thing. It's no. It's absolutely pitch black. No, I know. It's super dark. Really comfortable. And these ones even have adjustable razor thin speakers yep. in the ears that slide back and forward depending on the shape of your head. That's it. And I can confirm, as someone who studied sound engineering for years, yes. they actually sound really good. Mantis Sleep have provided us with a discount code. You get 10% off if you use discount code OBDAVE. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I mean, it, this is like daytime napping on the couch. Right. When the curtains are open. Yeah. Plonk this on. Having worked in, obviously, healthcare industries for most of my career, um, I've worked night shifts and trying to sleep during the day. Yeah. Even with blackout curtains and blinds, there's always that gap of light that gets through and it wakes you up or it keeps you awake because your body clock obviously wants to be awake in the sunlight. So having something like this is so useful for those night shifts. Yeah. You know what I think that would actually be great for, and it's just dawned on me in a second. Go on. Have you ever had to stay in hospital for a long time? Like Do you know sleep what? over in hospital? Though? Not for a long time, but the few times I have, even overnight, it's been very difficult to sleep with one, yeah. the noise on the ward and then the light coming through the yeah, it's, corridors. It, it and can things. be miserable, can't it? Use discount code OBDAVE at the checkout to get 10% off. Yes. And thanks to Manta Sleep for sponsoring the video. We appreciate it. Definitely. I was delayed. You could have done it didn't way go. better for that. To... <laughs> Hi guys, evening, welcome. We're going to do a quick intro on this one because I've just put our first ever ad read at the beginning of it. So uh, I didn't want to didn't want to take the Mickey in terms of people's watch time. No, because we do have a habit of waffling on. We do, and this is quite a long one. Fair warning, I watched this with the office folks a couple of months ago. The Fat Electrician, which okay. obviously lots of jokes have been made. <laughs> now that I've said I'm retiring from the office folks to become an electrician. Yeah. Um, apparently I'm going to be the new fat electrician. You're just an electrician. Not fat to me. We're doing a short intro, so let's not get into <laughs> debating whether I'm fat or not. I feel fat at the moment. I'm sorry, love. Feel free to comment below whether or not I'm fat. No fat chain. The fat electrician. Are you ready for yes. it? Yes. Ah, yes. The time. That the video is America obliterates half of Iran's navy in eight hours. Okay. Operation Praying Mantis. So he's talking navy stuff. In what sense is he electrician? Because he's an electrician. That's what oh. he does for a living. Oh, okay. And then he makes videos where he talks about stuff. Okay. Is that right? I think so. Sure. Yeah. That the U.S. Navy got upset and destroyed half of Iran's entire naval fleet in a single eight-hour workday. <laughs> Today we're talking about Operation Praying Mantis. But real quick, this video is sponsored by Zydax Custom Gaming PCs. They are all built right here in America with American-based tech support and a lifetime warranty. It's actually got some really cool merch that it'll show at the end. Yeah. Uh, I'm debating getting a fat electrician t-shirt. Why not? I think since, you know, because of reacting to his stuff, it'd only be fair as well. Yeah. So I think I'll get one. Yeah, I suppose. Or Iran decides, hey, and a lifetime warranty. It's the computer that I use and the one that I would recommend. I'll have them linked down below if you want to check them out. Let's get to this video. All right, important background info. 1980, Iraq decided to invade Iran. Why? Don't really care. Not pertinent to the story. However, at the end of that war, Iran decides, hey, we're going to pull a page out of the old art of war by Sun Tzu. We're going to cut off the enemy supply lines, deprive the enemy of nice things. It's going to work out great. Iraq's got a weak navy. We're going to wipe out their navy. And then every time they send out an oil tanker through the Persian Gulf, we're going to blow that up. So they can't sell any liquid dinosaur. They can't make any money. They go broke. We win the war. Hooray. It's a solid plan. So they do exactly that. Then Kuwait comes out of left field and they're like, hey, we've been financially backing Iraq through this entire war for the past seven years. We need to make sure they win so we can get our money back. So we're going to go ahead and let Iraq use our oil tankers to export oil. So Iran is like, well, that's an easy problem to solve. I'll just blow up all the Kuwaiti oil tankers as well, which is exactly what they do. But here's the catch. Kuwait at this point in time is like the one major exporter of oil that wasn't really part of OPEC, meaning that they were selling oil on the global market significantly cheaper than everybody else, driving 
driving down the entire oil market. And now that their oil tankers are getting blown up as well, it means that Kuwait can no longer sell oil on the cheap cheap, meaning that Iran has now inadvertently committed the cardinal sin of the late 20th century, raising gas prices. Now the entire Western world looks over at the Persian Gulf like, the fuck? The ghost of Sun Tzu's sitting there shaking his head like that's that's the one exception I would have messed with any supply line except for that one because we all know what happens next. Yeah, America then proceeds to assemble the largest naval convoy operation since World War II, send them into the Persian Gulf to protect Kuwaiti oil tankers. It is at this moment that Iran should have been like, well, that's unfortunate, time to figure out plan B because this obviously is not going to work out. However, they decide that they're going to double down. What they're going to do is they're going to take a bunch of magnetic underwater mines and they're just going to spread them out all over the Persian Gulf in international waters and that's not going to have any consequences at all so fast forward april 14th 1980 that's ridiculous like that's what, pretty what, shocking isn't yeah it? <laughs> what really were they thinking to make that kind of a decision i, just, I don't know desperation I don't, I, don't, I don't know what the regime was like in iran at the time but no. a, a lot of countries where it's sort of dictatorships you get these kind of megalomaniacs that are just like just do the thing you yeah know, and there could be general question going, me this is a terrible idea and it's <clears> like no don't question your Supreme leader yeah, or whatever. That's it, I get you. The USS Samuel B. Roberts, a guided missile frigate, which is basically brand new at this point, this is like its first big operation, is out there escorting a Kuwaiti oil tanker, and it runs into a minefield, hits a mine, blows up the keel of the ship. The keel is this bottom part right here. It like supports and stabilizes the structure of the entire ship, and it gets blown completely in half. At this point, the only thing holding this boat together is the actual deck. One second, everything's fine. The next second, there's a 15 foot wide hole in the bottom of your ship. Everything's on fire and water is rushing in. The USS Samuel B. Roberts took on half of its weight in water in the first minute. This is a catastrophic amount of damage that would sink 99% of ships, but as fate would have it, the crew of the USS Samuel B. Roberts had already been winning competitions for having the best damage control crew in the Navy. So the entire crew gets to work. They're putting out fires, they're plugging holes, they're literally cinching the hole together with steel cables trying to stabilize it because the only thing holding it together is a deck at this point. Over the course of the next five hours, the entire crew fights their ass off and somehow manages to get the situation under control and limp the ship all the way back to Dubai where they can get it to a port. And the most incredible part of all of it, not a single American was killed. Only 10 men were injured during the fire and the initial explosion. So the crew survived. The boats basically completely destroyed. Then America sends in an underwater crew, figure out what happened. They find the remnants of the mine. They check out the other mines. Yep, they're Iranian. At this point, now somebody has to inform the president because this is a big deal. And the president at this point in time is, let me check my notes, uh, fucking Ronald Reagan. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So they go ahead and they brief Ronald Reagan on everything that happened. He's super happy that everybody survived and he's like okay well here's what we're gonna do we're gonna issue a proportional response and what the u.s navy heard was I all right so here's the plan <laughs> iran currently has three oil rigs in the persian gulf that are not being used for drilling oil but as military bases for their naval operations so the u.s navy is going to go ahead and take out all three of those now i don't really know what the guided missile frigate to oil rig exchange ratio is but we're going to go ahead and err on the side of caution and say that it's not quite proportional enough yet so Iran also really only has like two modern naval vessels. That's the Iranian frigate Sahand and the Iranian frigate Sabatland. They're going to go ahead and take out at least one of those, maybe both. We'll see how proportional they want to get. And then by the time they get all that done, that should be a nice eight hour work day. It'll be time to clock out and go get some ice cream. So in order to get all this done by quitting time, they're going to go ahead and establish three different surface attack groups. Each group is going to have two destroyers and one bonus ship. That bonus ship is either going to be an amphibious landing ship or a frigate. Either way, they're all going to be identified identified as Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. Bravo group is tasked with taking out two oil rigs, Charlie group is tasked with taking out the one remaining oil rig, and Delta's mission is to go hunt down those two frigates and take them out. And then, just for insurance purposes, we're also going to have the USS Enterprise parked right outside the Persian Gulf to provide air support, you know, in case we need it. So, April 18th, 1980... Jesus, how that's proportional. Gonna, how do you think it's gonna go? <laughs> uh, very much on the American way. I mean, that's unbelievable mobilization and wow, what a fleet. <clears throat> I knew the US obviously Navy was was massive and they had an impressive fleet, but yeah. that that's incredible. Also, so, even during Reagan's time, like that is unreal. 
some of the ships, like some of the aircraft carriers they've got nowadays are absolutely insane. They're ridiculous. So amazing. So ridiculous. But yeah, it's just like one bad decision after another, and never a run. So stupid. But they they must have thought that they had a plan in their head or something, you know, to push this along. Because why would you poke the bear like that? It's like a plant in mines. And you can only imagine that the second a US ship got blown up by a mine, someone in Iran was going, shit. Uh, <laughs> time to, uh, like, evacuate. Yeah, I, res- <laughs> I resign. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to flee the country. 88, four days after the mining of the USS Samuel B. Roberts, Operation Praying Mantis goes into full swing, and Bravo Group shows up at their oil rig first. At which point they radio over to the oil rig and inform them that they will be blowing it up in five minutes and that they should all leave. So, a bunch of people start leaving. They hop in tugboats and take off. Bravo Group, seeing that they're making an honest effort to actually evacuate, agrees to give them 15 more minutes. So, fast forward 20 minutes later, they send out another radio message, hey, Time's up. They then fire the five inch guns right over the top of the oil rig with the rounds set to air burst, hopefully scaring off any stragglers. And it is at this point that some Iranian military member decides that he is going to audition to be the main character of this story because he hops on a 23 millimeter anti-aircraft gun and opens fire on Bravo Group. And without skipping a beat, one of the five inch guns on one of the destroyers just goes, Nyeh! Poof, and just fucking direct hit smokes this dude. Barely touches the rest of the oil rig, this guy, Definitely not the main character, but the silver lining, he at least made it into the credits as baloney miss cloud number one. <laughs> now, obviously I'm paraphrasing here, but at this point, Bravo Group radios over to the oil rig one last time, something along the lines of, hey, does anybody else need to find out what it's like to chew five gum? Are you fuckers ready to quit? The oil rig finally radios back and is like, yeah, yeah, please cease fire. We're gonna leave. So all the Iranian military members leave, Bravo Group decides to open up on it for a little bit with the five inch guns before sending over a couple of Hueys full of Marines. The Marines hop out, place some demo charges, hop back on the helicopters, take off. The entire oil rig blows up and already things are getting more proportional. <laughs> wow. And while all that was happening, Charlie Group made it to their first oil rig as well, and pretty much the exact same thing played out. The only differences were Charlie Group didn't have Marines to place the demo charges, they had Navy SEALs, and when the Iranians opened up with the 23mm anti-aircraft guns, they just decided to keep firing 5-inch shells at the oil platform until it burst into flames and burnt the entire thing to the ground. At which point, the commander of the destroyer kind of looks over at the Navy SEALs and is like, Sorry, I guess you guys get to sit this one out. Oh, mission got canceled? Good. And while all that's going down, Bravo Group's already making their way over to the third oil rig, at which point they pick up something on radar, and it's definitely another enemy ship headed right towards them. And at this point, you have to remember, this is the late 1980s. None of the American sailors have seen naval warfare on this scale. The pucker factor is on. They are getting harpoon missiles ready, and they are about to get in, like, one of the biggest naval fights since World War II. At which point, whoever's in charge of Bravo Group decides to take a deep breath, and they're like, okay, let's just... Let's send up a helicopter real quick just to verify that it's actually an enemy ship. So the helicopter goes up, radios back to Bravo Group. It's definitely a warship, but it's a Soviet destroyer. At which point everybody's like, what? What is happening right now? So they radio over to this Russian destroyer and they're like, what are your intentions? And the Russian commander radios back in broken English. I swear to God, this is a real quote. I'm just here to take pictures for history. Look, I know that I bash in the Soviet <laughs> Union and communism every single chance I get, but this time around, I gotta give it to them. These guys know how to party. Just straight up rolling into the middle of the largest naval operation since World War II to eat popcorn and watch. It's incredible. <laughs> At this point, Iran finally figures out that there's something going on, but they don't really know what, so they just begin attacking any ship they can find, and the first ship they found was a civilian cargo ship called the Willy Tide that they begin attacking with bog hammer style speedboats. So the Willy Tide radios for help, the US USS Enterprise responds by sending up a bunch of A6 intruders as well as F14 Tomcats. The A6 intruders show up, start dropping <laughs> yes. cluster bombs, they end up hitting one of the speedboats and scattering the rest. The civilian cargo ship is saved, hooray, cutting back to Charlie Group, now there's an Iranian fast attack ship coming right at them. So they radio over like, hey, yeah, we're kind of going around blowing up all your stuff, but also we've got a very specific list, you're not on it, so how about you just go away and we'll forget we saw you. The Iranian fast attack ship messages back, sounds good, we'll do that. And then they just keep driving right towards them. And then this Iranian fast attack ship gets within like 15 miles of Charlie Group, which is like point blank range for a naval battle. Charlie Group radios again, dude, what? 
are you doing? To which they respond, I'm following orders. And then they proceeded to lock their radar on Charlie Group, which Charlie Group can see. At which point, Charlie Group immediately launches five missiles directly at the Iranian vessel. The Iranian vessel fires a harpoon missile back at Charlie Group. Both groups now have missiles in the air screaming towards one another. The Americans launch countermeasures shooting up chaff rockets that end up catching the harpoon missile, detonating it in midair. The Iranian vessel, on the other hand, did not have any countermeasures capable of stopping the newer technology behind the American missiles, and it would end up getting sunk pretty much immediately. Then, before anybody can really even fully digest what just happened, Radar picks up three Iranian F-4s screaming towards Charlie Group. Charlie Group then turns, fires a bunch of surface-to-air missiles at the F-4s. The F-4s see them coming. They're like, oh shit. They pop a U-turn and try to outrun them. F-4s, while they are extremely fast, can't outrun missiles, so one of the missiles ends up blowing a wing off one of the F-4s. Now America has taken out an entire naval vessel and an F-4 that they did not plan on taking out, and it's throwing off all of our proportions. And because of that, American leadership orders Bravo Group to stand down. We're not going to go take out that third oil rig. And right as soon as that order gets given out, Delta Group chimes in and is like, hey, we found that frigate we were looking for. So now nobody knows what to do because on one hand, things are already getting out of control, but on the other hand, we really want to take out these frigates. So American leadership decides, well, we might not even have to make a hard decision. Maybe that's not even the frigate and the radar's wrong. Why don't you go ahead and send a couple A6 intruders over, do a flyby. They can verify that it's actually this new modern frigate. And if it is, we'll make a decision from there. Or so they thought because the A6 pilots are about to decide that they are in fact the main characters of this story. You see the USS Enterprise and its aircraft aren't really supposed to be doing a whole lot. They're more or less just there for insurance. In fact, they're only allowed to engage the enemy under one of two conditions. One, the President of the United States signs off on it, which is actually what happened with the speedboats earlier. Or two, they get fired upon first. So they got told to go fly by this boat to verify that it Oh my God. <laughs> they, the Iranians are going to shoot at them, aren't they? I'm not saying anything. Oh, come on. The I'm fact that these just said they're going to be the main characters... <clears throat> they definitely tried to defend themselves. Open it, fire on these planes. It's, it's and just they just seems, went, think, okay. He said it's 1980, didn't he? So I can only imagine that the Iranian Navy at this point are kind of like ignorant to what's coming but, towards them. Yeah. Because they probably thought we can just keep heading for that destroyer or whatever it was yeah. and attack and then we've got our planes behind us and yeah. we're going to win a heroic victory. And it's Not like you realizing. don't understand what you're actually doing. You don't understand the technology. Nope. You don't understand what's behind everyone. No. Nope. There's just no winning. It's just like... Just, but they, yeah. they obviously didn't know. Yeah. That's the, You can only put it down to either the leadership is like, if you retreat, you die. Well, yeah. Or pure ignorance of like, nah, they can't be that... They can't be that hard. Well, no, yeah. When, them out. when did the first mobile phone become a thing? And even then, you wouldn't have had signal out there. So how would they have been communicating? Oh, no, they, they could communicate... How? The ships. Mm. I mean, the radio in each other. But what's the distances? You don't know how far all of this is going on. No, they, they, they will have communication. I mean, the Americans... The Americans would have. I'm talking about the, the Iranians. The Iranians would as well. Really? Yeah, there was in Second World War, there was open communication. Yeah, I know, but what sort of distances? I don't know, but I'd, I'd, I'd imagine... Because you might be out in open water. I'd imagine there's sort of relays where like something picks it up and then boosts it and pings it off. Interesting. I think it, I don't think I don't know a lot about communications. Either. It's always fascinating to ask. Hmm. It is, in fact, the new modern frigate, but they didn't get told how to fly by the boat. So they drop down 50 feet above the water and just gun it, and they buzz the entire ship. So the ship opens fire with its AA guns, but these planes are so low to the water, the AA guns can't actually aim down low enough. So all the anti aircraft fire goes right over the top of them. They continue to stay low enough till they get out of anti aircraft gun range, and then they pull up, at which point the ship launches a bunch of surface to air missiles at them. They drop chaff as a countermeasure, takes care of those, no big deal. They then go around, do a U-turn, send a radio message to this frigate, I'm going to sink you now. Which they can now legally do, because remember, the ship fired on them first. Victim to one of the classic blunders. So the A6 fires an anti-ship harpoon missile, and the second they pull the trigger on that, the fire control team from the USS Enterprise is like, what the fuck are you doing? We're not supposed to be killing things yet. And the A6s are like, look... They fired at us first. Them's the rules. And the USS Enterprise is like, holy shit. Okay, I guess. 
let him have it. Then the harpoon missile finally makes impact. It's a bullseye. The A6s do a U-turn, go, drop another 500 pound laser guided bomb right through the deck of this frigate, fly past it, do another U-turn, come back, drop a thousand pound bomb on it. Then they radio over to the Enterprise and like, yeah, it's definitely gonna sink. We're gonna head back. So the A6s take off, headed back to the Enterprise. And like five minutes later, Delta Group shows up with their warships and begin firing on the already sinking frigate. They hit the magazine, the frigate explodes, rapidly sinks to the ocean floor. At this point, naval leadership is like, okay, Jesus Christ, everybody stop killing things. We need to figure <laughs> out what all happened. We gotta keep this proportional, remember. So they start radioing back and forth. Everybody's figuring out what everybody did, if anybody's hurt, what's going on, the whole story. And then as the A6s are making their way back to the USS Enterprise, guess what they happen to fly past? The other modern frigate. <laughs> so now the entire US Navy is looking at this last frigate like SpongeBob looking at a jug of water. But also, like realistically speaking, the A6s are pretty much out of ammunition. The only thing they have left are 2,000 pound bombs, and those just aren't gonna be enough by themselves without a harpoon missile to take down this ship anyways. So they really are just gonna fly by and verify that it's the modern frigate. So the A6 intruders go ahead, they do their flyby. It is in fact the new frigate that they thought it was, and it does in fact open fire on the A6s. A6s make it out completely unscathed, at which point they pop a U-turn and one of the A6 pilots is like, hmm. It's the bullseye womp rats in my T-16 back home. So the A6 pulls up, gaining altitude, and then dives down and its nose right at the frigate at like a 35 degree angle. They're doing a good old fashioned dive bombing run like it's fucking World War II. The AA guns start firing, there's bullets whizzing past the plane, but they're committed now. They're closing in, closing in. The bombardier behind the pilot lets the pilot know, hey, I'm locked on. At which point, bombs away, the pilot pulls up, and the bomb goes right down the fucking smokestack of this boat. Blows up, completely destroying the entire engine room. That frigate is now dead in the water with no power. The A6s go ahead and radio in that they have completely disabled this frigate, at which point the American leadership calls a complete ceasefire. They're gonna go ahead and let that frigate survive get towed off, potentially be repaired. With the US Navy having effectively disabled or destroyed over half of Iran's functioning Navy, the US military decides to call it a good day, ends Operation Praying Mantis, we all get to live happily ever after. Except, later that night, Iran decided that they wanted to fight a little bit more, and they launched a bunch of silkworm anti-ship missiles at American vessels. Luckily, no American vessels were actually hit. However, this is now a huge political problem because America has been mad at the fact that Iran even had silkworm missiles for years at this point, and the American government has made it very clear to Iran that if they ever used them, they would be going to war with America, period. That's set in stone. So the Reagan administration, not wanting to kick off World War III in the 1980s, reaches out to the Iranian government and is like, here's what's going to happen. You're going to go ahead and admit that that was an accident. I'm going to sweep it under the rug and we're never going to talk about it again. Because if this makes headline news and the American people find out, I'm going to have to get real proportional around here. So Iran's <laughs> like, okay, fine, whatever. It was an accident. Let's sweep that whole thing under the rug. But I am still going to take America to international court to try to prove that it was a war crime to take out my oil rigs. That way I can get reparations and make America pay for it. So they go to international court. They lay out the case. The international court is looking at America like, okay, well, first of all, you're the fraction people. I don't know how you think that this is proportional, but it definitely wasn't. Second of all, according to the Amity Act, you absolutely should not have attacked their oil rigs. This is probably a war crime. At which point the representative for America is like, well, actually, if you read the Amity Treaty between Iran and the United States, it only talks about ships and boats. It don't say shit about oil rigs, meaning I wasn't obligated to not attack those oil rigs. At which point the court is like, hold on. Hold on, hold on. <sighs> Fucking, he's right, son of a bitch. Okay, well, I guess America's innocent because I've said it once and I'll say it again. It's never a war crime the first time. And now for the best part of the entire <laughs> story. The America now proceeds. That's the one you need. Merch. That is the exact shit. The, the you first need. time I saw that, I was like, I think I need that. You need that I shit. I think I may very well need you that t-shirt. That shit. Oh my god, yeah. We'll, we'll have a look at the merch story yes. and see what there is. Okay, well, I guess. America's innocent, because I've said it once and I'll say it again, it's never a war crime the first time. And now for the best part of the entire story, America now proceeds to go over to Dubai, pick up what's left of the USS Samuel B. Roberts, 
tow it all the way back to Maine, then take the ship out of the water, get it in dry dock, cut out the entire damage section of the ship, including the engine compartment, build another module to fit in its place. This thing weighs like 300 tons. They jack it up, weld it right where it's at, get everything rehooked up, reconnected. And this boat is back out on the ocean one year later on April 1st, 1989. Smart, it then it? goes on to get recommissioned and serves in the Navy until 2015. I mean, playing Battleship against America's gotta suck, right? Like, haha, I've sunk your frigate, and America's like, first of all, no you didn't. Second of all, fuck your entire Navy as it picks up your board and just throws it at the wall. So in conclusion, if you do ever find yourself being the leader of a foreign nation one day, the best advice that I can possibly give you is A, do whatever you can to not raise gas prices, and B, whatever you do, do not fuck with America's boats. We do not like that shit. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is like, comment, subscribe. Maybe go buy some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. I like him. He's funny. He's good, isn't he? He is really good. I like all the little slipping of the memes. It's like SpongeBob looking at a jug of water. I don't need it. I think. I need it. I think he does a podcast with Donut Operator. Really? That doesn't surprise me. They seem uh, like they would be friends. Fat electrician. Let's have a look. Oh, he has definitely got a podcast. Excuse me for uh, your name. Oh my gosh. Fat electrician podcast. Unsubscribe podcast. Yeah, there's Donut Operator. Yeah. It's basically, it seems like that whole crew of like, you know, like Brandon Herrera, I wouldn't mind betting Demo Ranch has got something to do oh, with it. Oh yeah, Matt that. Carrick has probably got something in there as well. Doesn't yeah. surprise me either. It looks like they have a lot of fun. Anyway, we need to check out some of that. Yes. But yeah, that's... Uh, that's amazing. That was great so much fun. great at telling fun. stories, isn't it? He's really interesting. Like, seriously, that they rained hell on the Iranians. That's incredible. Yeah. Like, what did they think? What did they think was going to happen? When it's they mad, were... isn't it? It's just crazy. But... So you you see get. it all the time in history, don't you? Someone small thinks, hey, we can do this. Well, fuel prices here are crazy because of the um, Russia-Ukraine conflict. Yeah. Well, no, isn't it to do with the canal? The Suez Canal? No, yeah. that, that got sorted. Oh, did that, that was like sorted? two years ago that happened. No, it, it, didn't it happen again recently? There no. was loads of problems with... No, what's happening at the moment is uh, the Houthis off the coast of Yemen are bombing commercial ships. Um, and that's why... The UK and allies and stuff have been bombing oh. targets in Yemen because Yemen is at war with Saudi Arabia and we're, we're uh, providing weapons to Saudi Arabia. That's mental. You but can tell how like, much I listen to the news. The shipping route goes past Yemen for most global shipping Jeez. to the Suez Canal. Yeah. Um, but now people are going all the way around Africa. So that's why everything's gone expensive. That's, that's one of the reasons. That's crazy. Hmm. One of the many reasons. Yeah. Anyway... Hope you guys enjoyed that too. As always, make sure you like and subscribe. It does mean the absolute world, especially since uh, this is going to be my only reaction thing going forward. Yes, and according to all the comments in the last video, the vote has been made. Your pocket money will be £1.50. Nice. <laughs> nice, I'm not that cheap, you know. Got expensive tastes. Where's the door? How do I get out? Save me. You know where the door is. You've paid your rent this month, so... <laughs> right then cheers for that one guys make sure you like and subscribe as always again and uh, we'll see you soon bye guys <laughs>